Maryland is known for many things, like Baltimore and blue crabs. However, the weather in Maryland is contrarily dull. Although the state receives all types of weather, no one category stands out. Snowstorms, hurricanes, tornadoes, and droughts are rarely severe and occur only once in a while. April 28, 2002 was a glaring exception to this idea. On that fateful day, an extremely powerful F4 tornado would touch down near La Plata in southeastern Maryland. This event would mark the most destructive tornado in the state's history. Most of downtown La Plata was decimated, with thousands of trees uprooted and many businesses completely collapsed. Even worse, severe communications problems disallowed many residents from receiving weather updates. Sadly, three people were killed and over 120 injured. In this video, we'll look at the tornado from its origins in West Virginia to the impacts that have scarred La Plata for years since. To put into perspective just how rarely a violent tornado touches down in Maryland, the state had only seen two other F4s in reliable record, a 1998 F4 near Frostburg and a 1926 F4 that also, ironically, struck La Plata. The state is lucky to see one tornado a year in the month of April, and any tornadoes that form are almost always weak. In fact, out of the 328 tornadoes that touched down in Maryland from 1950 to 2012, almost 300 of them, over 90%, were weak F0 or F1 tornadoes. Only nine significant tornadoes of F3 intensity or greater occurred during the 63-year time period, the equivalent of almost one per decade. There are a couple of reasons to this. First, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico, generally necessary for thunderstorm formation, moves northward into the plains instead of northeast. Also, the Appalachian Mountains act sort of as a shield against strong thunderstorms and tornadoes, since storms crossing the mountain range usually become disorganized as they move east into Maryland. Either way, strong tornadoes like the La Plata F4 are virtually unprecedented in the area. Consequently, residents on April 28th were not prepared. On top of the tornado's unlikely location, it also formed during a quiet tornado season. 2002 started as an abnormally weak year for tornadoes in the U.S. January only had three weak tornadoes, far less than the 42 that occur on average. February was even quieter, with only two tornadoes compared to a monthly average of 39. Even March was below average, with 47 confirmed tornadoes compared to the running average of 89. As the peak of tornado season approached in the spring, it was looking like conditions would stay relatively quiet over the United States. It's Sunday, April 28, 2002. The 7,000 residents of La Plata wake up in the morning to attend church, take care of the house, and go fishing on the Chesapeake. Thousands of feet above them, however, a potent upper-level trough was inducing strong southwesterly winds in the upper troposphere. A warm front was draped over the area, producing hot, stuffy morning air. Also, the atmosphere was predicted to turn unstable into the afternoon hours, as indicated by Cape values in excess of 2,000 joules per kilogram. Cape corresponds to the amount of instability in the atmosphere, and with numbers that high, moist air would be advected high into the sky, creating a breeding ground for strong, tall thunderstorms. Noting the potential for tornadoes in the evening hours, the National Weather Service issued a tornado watch for a large portion of the Mid-Atlantic. However, most people weren't too worried. La Plata receives around one tornado watch every month during the spring, similar in frequency to areas like Houston and Chicago, so longtime residents were acclimated to the watches. A line of discrete thunderstorms moved westward into the Appalachian Mountains over West Virginia at around 2.30 p.m. These thunderstorms, which are fueled by rising air in the atmosphere, strengthened due to the upslope of the mountains. In other words, the ground was making it significantly easier for the air to rise. This phenomenon is called orographic lifting. On the other side of the mountains, however, occurs a process called downsloping. When air moves down a mountain, the column of air above it grows taller, compressing the air below by weighing it down. 
This compressed air cannot hold as much water, so the air dries. As a result, mountains tend to kill off passing thunderstorms because of the downsloping, dry air. As expected, most of the thunderstorms passing through the Appalachians fizzled out. However, one potent supercell thunderstorm kept itself together and moved past the mountain chain around 4 p.m. Slowly intensifying as it crossed into Virginia, the supercell began exhibiting signs of rotation near Shenandoah County. Just before 5, a funnel cloud extended to the ground and a brief F2 tornado was produced from this parent supercell. With prime atmospheric conditions, forecasters were growing extremely wary of the storm as it moved briskly east. Even though the tornado lifted in west central Virginia, based on radar images, the National Weather Service issued a string of tornado warnings as the supercell tracked across Virginia. With no tornado reports, and believing that the tornadic potential was decreasing into Maryland, forecasters instead issued a severe thunderstorm warning as the complex moved across the Potomac River. However, almost as if to foreshadow what would go down in La Plata, the severe thunderstorm warning was accompanied by this ominous message. Severe thunderstorms can produce tornadoes with little or no advance warning. By 6 p.m., forecasters were worried that the supercell would track directly through La Plata. One meteorologist, Howard Bernstein, described the situation as the supercell crossed over the Potomac River. And remember, that thing was going for a while across Virginia, looked great on radar, but wasn't producing a tornado until it crossed the Potomac. And when we talk about... Indeed, forecasters at NWS Sterling, the local weather service office, noticed that the thunderstorm had begun exhibiting rotation as it crossed into Maryland shortly before 7. Velocity data indicated winds moving away from the radar, denoted in red, adjacent to winds moving towards the radar, denoted in green. This phenomenon of red next to green is known as coupling, and it usually means a rotating supercell or full-fledged tornado. Based on damage reports from the ground, an official service assessment marks the touchdown time of the tornado at 6.56 p.m. Six minutes later, at 7.02 p.m., NWS Sterling pulled the trigger for a tornado warning. F-Zero damage was reported near Marbury, Maryland, a mere nine minutes from La Plata. Immediately, forecasters could sense that something was wrong. Typical tornadoes in the U.S. move at 10 to 20 miles an hour. However, the La Plata tornado was in a rush, moving at an average speed of 60 miles an hour during most of its life. Within minutes, the storm was at F2 intensity as it moved south-southeast through the small communities of Pisgah and Ripley. This quick intensification could be attributed to dew points near 65 Fahrenheit and plentiful unstable air ready to pop. At 7.02 p.m., the tornado entered the western side of La Plata. In the Quailwood neighborhood on the outskirts of town, F3 damage was exhibited by a pair of houses flattened, with only the foundations left standing. Countless branches and trees were permanently mangled, and many homes had only interior walls left standing. As the tornado warning was renewed, NWS Sterling used the following grim wording. At 7.02 p.m., emergency officials reported a tornado on the ground over La Plata in Charles County moving east. This is a dangerous storm. Seek shelter immediately. Unfortunately, many people weren't able to get word of the situation. The Emergency Alert System, or EAS, did not activate for a few local radio stations. Many other radio stations, over 50% of those broadcasting in La Plata, had power outages or other similar issues. As a result, many residents weren't aware of the tornado until minutes before it hit. According to the tornado assessment, many simply saw the tornado or were notified by neighbors before taking shelter. Although three deaths are three too many, it's good news that more people weren't killed despite the communications problems. The storm kept getting stronger as it curved directly east. The tornado also grew in size with a width of 650 yards, almost half a mile. Many areas of F4 damage were reported, the first being along Route 6 in western La Plata, where the city's water tower was pummeled. Many other homes and businesses received F3 to F4 damage, 
including a local market with only a few walls remaining. An expanse of trees between the downtown and western areas was torn by the tornado, visible from the air. The tornado approached the intersection of Route 6 and US 301, the two primary roads through town. Heartbreakingly, this was where the worst F4 damage was found. On US 301, the La Plata United Methodist Church completely lost its steeple and received severe structural damage to its upper floors. In the parking lot, cars were blasted by debris and crumpled. 500 feet away, a strip mall at the intersection of 6 and 301 received immense structural damages. A large CVS pharmacy, multiple gas stations, a brand new orthodontist office, a KFC, and many, many other businesses were demolished by winds in excess of 200 miles an hour. Miraculously, nobody was killed in this area. The tornado cleared the intersection in seconds. This incredible forward speed proved to be a double-edged sword, since the twister had less time to dwell over buildings, but was also able to cover more ground and damage more structures. A slower tornado would have impacted less structures, but the damages could have been even more severe. Unfortunately, the parent supercell spawned a second vortex south of the primary tornado. The secondary vortex eventually became a tornado of its own, reaching F2 intensity as it rotated towards downtown La Plata. The intersection of Route 6 and US 301, which had been devastated only a couple minutes prior, was further damaged by the secondary tornado. As the two tornadoes sped off into eastern La Plata, more trees and homes were destroyed. Just east of downtown, a brick building completely slid off of its foundation and was pummeled by chunks of debris. This was initially rated as F5 damage, the highest on the Fujita scale. However, subsequent reanalysis found the damage to be high end F4, still unimaginably strong for the Mid-Atlantic. Despite slight weakening of the tornado, Incredibly dangerous F2 to F3 damage continued eastwards, with a pair of houses completely flattened near Route 6. One of these houses contained seven people, all of whom survived. Unfortunately, others weren't as lucky. A 51-year-old man was killed by the tornado in his house, with his wife critically injured, close by on Hawkins Mill Road. Incredibly, the twister continued at strong F2 to F3 intensity throughout Charles County. During its trek through the county, almost 150 businesses were damaged with 49 completely destroyed. 638 homes faced destruction from the tornado, the vast majority of which occurred within La Plata. Eventually, the tornado moved into neighboring Calvert County, where two more deaths occurred when an elderly couple seeking shelter in their poorly anchored house had the home thrown over 80 feet into a waterway. The Chesapeake Bay was fast approaching. Normally when tornadoes move over water, they become a tornadic water spout. However, the La Plata tornado didn't feel like conforming to the norm. Instead, the parent supercell spawned a satellite water spout, meaning that two individual vortices were crossing the bay. This amazing meteorological phenomenon was fortunately captured on camera. The primary tornado continued over land into Dorchester County, on the other side of the bay, where F3 intensity was maintained over much of the county. Loose pieces of paper, like paper checks, were discovered in southern Delaware over 60 miles away. At last, the tornado ran out of juice as it began a terminal weakening trend on approach to Salisbury, Maryland, and dissipated southwest of Quantico, over 65 miles away from the devastation in La Plata. The tornado had a great impact on the meteorological community. It brought up discussion on differentiating F4 and F5 tornado damages, and was one of the events that eventually led to the creation of the Enhanced Fujita, or EF, scale in 2007. 
The tornado's preliminary F5 rating, had it been verified, would have blown away the previous record for the furthest east F5. However, even with the downgrade to F4 intensity, the tornado was incredibly dangerous with its over 200 mile per hour winds and 60 mile per hour movement speed. It would become the strongest tornado in Maryland history and one of the strongest across the eastern seaboard. As the sun set and recovery efforts began, the tornado's widespread destruction became apparent. The three counties in the tornado's path all issued state of emergencies. FEMA, the Red Cross, and state aid all rushed to the town. Within two days, over 90% of the debris had been cleared. Beyond the rubble are signs of survival, rebirth, even normalcy. Schools will reopen tomorrow. These townspeople proving their buildings may crumble, but their spirits won't be broken.